master's in global health delivery program. And we're just very delighted to have Dr. Vikram Patel. He is the Pershing Square uh, Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine. He's a world-renowned expert in the delivery of mental health care and the study of mental health interventions. Um, and I want to say that we have been very fortunate in the program to have many students take on mental health as their primary research project. And I think that's because we are always in our department and in our program looking at the most vulnerable, looking at the areas where there are enormous gaps in care. And we know that um, mental health has long been neglected as too complicated, as you know, not really amenable to treatment. And yet, uh, people that we see around the world suffering from mental illness are some of the most marginalized people. So we're very delighted to really have this group uh, from multiple classes, Dr. Reginel Fizame uh, from Haiti. He's actually calling in from Haiti, been, you know, helping with this amazing work of Zami La Santé um, to keep the 17 facilities across the country open even when 85% of the public facilities have been closed due to violence. And you can imagine how that ongoing violence uh, impacts the mental health of all of our patients, um, exacerbates existing problems and causes new ones. Um, Anil Brar and both Rejim uh, Fizame and uh, Anil Brar are in PhD programs really studying this. So I think the the master's program for them was really a launching pad uh, to continue to do work in this field. Um, and uh, Anil Brar, I want to call him doctor, but he's not yet, uh, is uh, studying his PhD at Oxford University and has worked for a long time in Rajasthan area and very uh, small communities and, and saw mental health as an enormous burden uh, for people, particularly women, uh, bearing the brunt of not only illness, but caretaking. Uh, and then Dr. Ginger Ramirez, who is uh, from the Philippines, actually Anil is calling from a tent in Kenya, uh, though his primary work is in India. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ginger Ramirez, who is a passionate advocate for um, mental health in interventions, particularly for young people, um, which is a very difficult topic to study because of the vulnerability of these people, but she's been able to do that working uh, with Vikram and others. So we're, I, I'm sure we're gonna have a rich conversation about gaps, about implementation, uh, and about how we think of the importance of mental health in this sort of much broader scope of global health delivery and global health implementation. So I'll turn it over to you, Vikram. Well, thank you so much, Joya. Thank you for, uh, and, and thank you very much, Christina uh, and Bailey for having organized this wonderful panel of three alum, uh, at least two of whom I have known very well and I'm hoping very much to learn uh, from the third um, during the course of the next are also. So my name is Vikram Patel. I am a psychiatrist by training and a professor of global health uh, at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And it will be important for me to just contextualize this panel by uh, commenting on the rich history uh, of uh, this department in terms of the scholarly contributions that the department has made that I think have been probably central, uh, unlike any other department, uh, in locating mental health, conversations on mental health within the broader global health context. Let me explain what I mean. For a long, long time, uh, conversations about mental health were typically siloed off, uh, not just from conversations about physical health, but also conversations about how healthcare systems should be organized, conversations about the social determinants and consequences uh, of health problems. Um, and this was, of course, epitomized in the construction uh, of the asylum. The asylum, I think, in many ways, um, really uh, epitomized the idea that mental health was separate from all other health and social concerns in the literal and physical incarceration and separation of people with mental health problems from their communities, from their societies. It is the work of people in this department 
you know, incredible scholars like Arthur Kleinman, Byron and Mary Jo Good, uh, and others who demonstrated, in fact, how mental health was inseparable from other health concerns and moreover inseparable from social and structural determinants. And this is why I think the, uh, the, the, the slogan that has been coined in recent times, no health without mental health, um, is not only, uh, I, th I think not only does it owe a lot to what uh, work uh, has been happening in this department, but I think it, it also extends to no sustainable development uh, without mental health. For as Joya has so rightly pointed out, Mental health is intertwined with one's lived experience, and those lived experiences are characterized by disadvantages and, of course, opportunities in one's social environments from the earliest years of our life, the environments that we have in our families into which we are born, to the environments in schools as we grow up, neighborhoods, and ultimately the broader world uh, that we will live in. Today, we have three incredible panelists. Uh, Joya uh, has uh, already given brief introductions to each of them. Uh, all three of them are alum of our master's program in global health delivery. Uh, and what's terrific is all three work uh, in very different parts of the world. And I'm sure what we're going to hear today from them is not only the diversity, a flavor really, of the diversity of different kinds of mental health issues uh, that we have to deal with. Because let, let me just say what I mean. Oftentimes people talk about mental health as if it's one homogenous category of health concerns. Uh, but in fact, what we're going to hear today is three examples of, of the diversity of different mental health issues and concerns, but also three very different contexts um, that each of them work in. And I hope that during these presentations and conversations, we'll begin to see how context matters, but also, hopefully, how certain aspects of the experience uh, of mental health and mental health problems might also be generalizable uh, across contexts. So let me, let me move uh, straight into our first presentation, and that is going to be uh, from uh, Ginger Ramirez. Uh, Ginger was uh, one of our master's students who just completed uh, her degree uh, a few months ago. So congratulations, Ginger. It was a spectacularly difficult time uh, for people to be studying uh, 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 because, of course, the pandemic meant that most of our students were unable to be physically together. Uh, so Ginger, congratulations on being able to navigate these extremely difficult couple of years. And I'm sure we hear from you about those a uh, couple of years, but let me just do a brief bio introduction. So Ginger is a public health physician from the Philippines whose work is focused on mental health and human rights, something uh, that I think is central to conversations on mental health. She has experience in policy and program development at various levels of the health system, from rural communities to the National Department of Health. She's a senior fellow of the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity and is a consultant for technical assistance projects to the WHO in the Philippines and also to the country's uh, National Suicide Registry and Transitional Mental Health Information System. Uh, Ajinja, I'm hoping you're to say a little bit more also about these different uh, activities and, 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 uh, and organizations. Ginger researched public mental health and suicide prevention for her thesis uh, and graduated earlier this year. So Ginger, I'm looking forward to hearing from you first about uh, some of the key findings uh, on the lived experience of uh, young people in the Philippines who have attempted suicide uh, as, as a way of a context. Suicide is the leading cause of death in young people around the world. Um, so let's hear a little bit more about Ginger's work uh, with young people who have survived an attempt, uh, and then hopefully a little bit more uh, also about your current uh, and ongoing work in the Philippines. Over to you, Ginger. Thank you very much, Vikram. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, are you seeing this? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Vikram. Thank you, Joya. Um, all right, so good evening from the Philippines. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, so I will be sharing my research on the suicidal behavior of Filipino adolescents. Um, and um, the other work that I've been doing, maybe it, um, there will be time to discuss that at the end um, as well, and even in the Q&A portion of this um, presentation. Okay. So um, 
when I tell people that I study uh, suicidal behavior, um, no one really asks me why I decided to research this topic. So um, even if you're not asking, and I will tell you, um, because in the middle of the pandemic um, in 2020, I was speaking with friends who were immersed in communities. They were health officers, community mayor, um, workers, mayors, and we were asking them how we can support their COVID response. I personally expected them to um, request for additional PPEs, medications, or helping set up their laboratories. Um, and so I was surprised when they said that they needed help with the cases of suicides, especially among adolescents and even children as young as 10. There were increasing suicide deaths and there were they were at a loss as to what to do. And so in the midst of all this, I was about to begin my program here in the um, in, in the, the master's program. And, and so I thought this is why I'm taking this program to understand, to help understand and address felt needs and issues on the ground and to help alleviate people's suffering, especially when it comes to um, tackling stigmatized topics of mental health and suicide. And was discussed earlier, we addressing the needs of vulnerable communities. Um, and so I embarked on a qualitative study to listen to their voices and to explore the lived experience of adolescents with a previous suicide attempt. Um, so for this research, we purposefully sampled Filipino adolescents aged 12 to 19 with a history of a suicide attempt and interviewed them twice, six to eight weeks apart. So we used the interpretative phenomenological analysis or IPA method which is a highly inductive approach that seeks to understand how individuals interpret, attach meaning, and make sense of their experiences. So IPA focuses on understanding the phenomena from the individual's rich and unique perspective and not from any predetermined framework. So it is best suited for a deep understanding of the complexity of suicidal behavior, and they often have small sample sizes to allow in-depth exploration. So for this research, we interviewed three adolescents, 18-year-old um, Gia, 17-year-old Wesley, and 15-year-old Reese. Um, these are pseudonyms, by the way, and that's the overview of some of their characteristics. So I'll just jump into sharing the, the results and the analysis. So what did we learn? So from this research, we were able to generate um, seven induct in inductively derived concepts, which I will briefly discuss with all of you. So at the individual level, adolescents relate their experiences of extreme emotional anguish with their suffering that is tied to the belief that they are not good enough and that they are deserving of punishment. So there is internalization and somatization. They were feeling chest pain, spurning the sensation. Their brains were noisy like popcorn. And while they tried to employ healthy coping strategies, at some point, with increasing intensity of their distress, suicide then becomes the pathway to escape and manage their internal chaos. Second is the role of family. So families are a significant source of both distress and support. So all of the participants have an experience of a familial rupture between um, the ages of 7 to 10. So there was parental infidelity, domestic abuse and violence, neglect and abandonment. Um, but interestingly, when the parents are not able to provide the support that the adolescents need, extended family members such as aunts, grandmothers, cousins, step in and were able to facilitate communication between the parents and the adolescent and even access to specialist care. Next is that adolescents were able to describe three different types of friendships. So there are deep and real friendships founded on trust, but they also have what Reese called um, lunchbox friends. So these are friends you simply eat with or do activities with. They are friends who provide companionship. And online gaming is actually one avenue where they meet new friends and with whom they have shared interests. Romantic relationships also provide intimacy, but are highly emotional and volatile. So at the height of the conflict, both uh, at the height of conflict, both G and Wesley were told by their partners that they should just die. So prior to their suicide attempt, the adolescents um, disclosed suicidal ideation and actually tried to ask for help. 
However, all of them received invalidating and dismissive comments, such as, it's just in your mind, you're not really sick. Um, Reese was even ridiculed and laughed at by her father. Um, so when we asked what kind of response they would have wanted to receive when they asked for help, um, it was simple. They say that they said that people should just listen and be kind. Next, they also relay some social norms that perpetuate stigma and discrimination in the community. So negative and judgmental stereotypes um, of um, homosexuals in movies and shows um, are offensive to members of the LGBTQI community, which Reese identified with. Um, religion also significantly shape adults' perception of suicide. Um, mental health conditions are spiritualized and symptoms are seen as a deficiency in the practice of one's faith. So in Filipino, they would hear this phrase, kulang kalang sa dasal, or you're just not praying enough. And this is important because the Philippines is um, 80%, over 80% um, Roman Catholic. So um, religion plays a very important role. Um, next is, um, while there are risks to social media, it is mainly helpful for these adolescents. So YouTube videos, vlogs, documentaries are sources of information. Facebook groups foster communities. TikTok is a source of inspirational and motivational content. And even memes make mental health discussions light, accessible, and easy to share. And lastly, there are important structural factors as well. So earlier it was mentioned, uh, the social determinants were mentioned. And this is part of, um, part of these structural factors. So... Um, for Gia, she felt abandoned and neglected when she was left behind because her parents worked abroad. This labor out migration, which is very, very common in the Philippines, directed, um, directly impacted her family dynamics. And government policies and actions on substance use impact the supply and demand on drugs in the streets. Um, so Wesley advocates that it be treated as a mental health issue rather than a criminal issue so that people can receive the care that they need. Okay, so analysis of these concepts um, map well onto Bronfen Brenner's ecological framework from the individual to the macro level. So it is color-coded in this slide. Um, and basically, the framework emphasizes the importance of an integrated, multi-layered approach to suicide prevention and adolescent well-being. So what are the recommendations? So at the individual level, there are interventions that are existing and we must continue strengthening the individual social, emotional and positive coping life skills of adolescents, um, like emotional regulation, which is um, important, especially since adoles adolescents display more impulsive behavior. Access to specialist care is in, like in the Philippines, like in many other LMICs are, is limited. And we, this is um, one point of highlighting the importance of engaging stakeholders at various levels of the ecosystem and not just focusing mainly on specialist clinical care. Uh, interventions at the family level have yet to be maximized, especially for countries like the Philippines with strong family ties and collectivist cultures. Family members are the gatekeepers to mental health treatment and are often the recipients of suicidal disclosure. Uh, Family-based programs to strengthen adult ad to adolescent relationships can build resilience and target conflict and stress. Um, School-based interventions are notably lacking in our findings. Um, establishment of school mental health and suicide prevention protocols are invaluable, as well as peer support networks. Um, just very quickly, the um, we are actually currently right now in the Philippines, we're working with the Department of Health and the World Health Organization Philippines um, to develop a training program, a basic training program for schools, for suicide prevention in schools. And that's something that is a priority of the Department of Health. At the NESO level, there's potential for us to leverage the power of social media. So this, for me, is where we can truly come together as a global community. Um, we need to maximize the creation of safety and access touch points with the help of social media platforms, um, where adolescents can access accurate, helpful, and timely mental health information and resources. They can be informational videos, encouraging or inspirational content, access to crisis lines or teleconsultations. So often adolescents do not have income, 
So free services go a long way. It is very important for them to have access to free services to minimize the barriers. So we need to proactively bring resources and services closer to, the adult, to our adolescents through online spaces. And lastly, the, at the macro level, policy level, um, we, we should focus um, on attending to at-risk groups, such as left-behind children of migrant workers, persons who use drugs, and gender and sexual minorities, and not only provide general mental health care, but also provide specific suicide-specific interventions that are particularly unique to their communities. So that's basically me sharing the, the results of the, the research, which is actually still ongoing. Uh, I'm still continuing the research even after um, I've completed the, the program. Um, but basically to say that um, adolescent suicide is a public health priority that requires complementary multi-level interventions. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen an increase in anxiety, depression, and suicide attempts among young people um, worldwide and in the Philippines. It's really an urgent um, need to attend to this crisis. And thankfully, suicide is preventable and there is hope and we all have a role to play in alleviating each other's suffering and um, potentially saving um, people's lives. So thank you. I'd like to just acknowledge the, my advisory team for the thesis, which um, I'm glad to have finished last May. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ginger. Thanks for that terrific presentation. Ginger, you know, I, I, I have worked with you over the last two years and seen that some of the challenges um, of, of the research subject that you chose, um, you, you didn't choose an easy one for two reasons. First of all, talking about suicide itself is a very delicate and sensitive uh, 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 matter, but in particular, you were working with adolescents who, were <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the traditional research context, are individuals who cannot themselves agree to participate in research. Um, you have to go through the gatekeeper for adolescents, typically the parent, and there are also whole ranges of ethical questions that often arise. And, and I wonder whether you could share a little bit about um, your experience of trying to do this this kind of study. Some people may think, you know, interviewing three people, uh, you know, that's not a big number, but you and I know that this is not only a big enough number for the kind of method you chose, but in the context of this research, it's an incredible achievement to have been able to interview these three individuals. So I wonder whether you can speak to our audience about the specific challenges of working with adolescents and in the context of mental health problems and what might be the lessons uh, for others who want to enter into this field. Thank you very much, Vikram. Um, well, I guess in general, one of the main areas of concern really was this was safety. Um, so first, the safety of the adolescents that we were um, um, I was going to interview. Um, one because of the current context of the pandemic, um, their mental health status. Number two, since we were doing the interviews online, there was a little bit more. Um, there were more barriers to ensuring their their physical safety as well. Um, and this safety was um, emphasized by the various um, institutional review boards that had to have to review this protocol. So it was um, very much emphasized um, that um, there was a safety protocol in place to ensure that the adolescents feel that they are safe and that they're able to, that we can provide them the the necessary interventions when necessary when when there is a need to do so so for example we had to make a, a safety protocol and to be clear like, who will be accountable for what ensuring how we can access their um psychiatrists their mental health their their parents as well and and that really when when talking to um, physicians, or psychiatrists, talking to parents, talking to institutional review boards. When we put like the issue of safety front and center, it was basically what people were mainly concerned about. When that was addressed, everything else was kind of secondary to that. And I think in addition to all of these um, things that I've mentioned, for me personally, when, when I was doing the interviews, I had to make sure of um, two things. Number one, that I myself was um, okay when going about it and I was ready to also listen to their stories um, and um, listening, anticipating the, the, the struggles that they will be sharing with me. And because 
in order to conduct this research well, I need to make sure that I can provide them that the support that they need while we're having that interaction. So even if I'm not their clinician, I'm not their therapist, the interview can be um, a source of distress for them and being able to train myself as a um, as, as a researcher who is conducting suicide research, I need to um, have those skills so that I can provide them the, the, the interventions that, that they need during that time. So, um, so, so thankfully, all of them were actually um, very pleased with that kind of opportunity to share their stories. And even if there were challenges with their own sharing of experiences, it was overall um, um, a very positive experience for them. And because they were saying that um, generally adolescents want to share their stories. They want to be heard. Um, and especially for something as difficult as suicide that other people don't really want to talk about um, other than their therapist. <laughs> their, um, that this is really a welcome opportunity for them to like, to allow themselves to process their own experiences as well. Thank you so much, Ginger. Uh, and you know, hopefully if we have time later on, I'd love to hear from you and the others uh, about how working in the sector affects your own mental health and how you can care for yourself. You've heard, we've heard about how it was beneficial to the respondents, but I, I wanted to hear more about also what it, what it feels like and you know, to, to, to hear these stories of distress uh, uh, from others and how that might affect yourself and how you protect it and support your, your own well-being. Let me move on to our second panelist, uh, uh, and this is Dr. Uh, Reginald Fizame, who is a physician who has worked for more than a decade with partners in health uh, in Haiti, Haiti and, uh, in, and Liberia. Uh, with his colleagues, he has successfully implemented a model of mental health care, integrating mental health care into routine primary care in the facilities run by Zanmi Lasante in Haiti. He has completed his master's in medical sciences and global health delivery in 2016. Uh, and his thesis explored the lived experience of the recovery process of people with psychosis in rural Haiti. He's currently a PhD student in the global health program of uh, Montreal University School of Public Health and also in charge of government relations at Zanmi Lasante. Uh, Reginald, we are looking forward to hearing your uh, uh, about your experiences in designing and implementing a psychosocial rehabilitation program in Haiti and Liberia. Reginald, over to you. Thank you very much, Vikram, and thank you everyone for organizing this panel. So, yes, I will. I'm glad to talk about my experience in designing, I mean, how the, the findings from my thesis research informed the design and implementation of a psychosocial rehabilitation program that I did with my colleagues at Zomi La Santé and uh, in PIH Liberia. But also I will take this opportunity to uh, make a call for more emphasis on psychosocial rehabilitation in global mental health, on psychosocial rehabilitation, on inclusion of psychosocial rehabilitation uh, services in mental health uh, treatment programs in low and middle income countries. And I would like to start, um, do you hear me well and do you see the slides? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start with these two uh, pieces of art from a young lady who is now in recovery in Haiti. Um, and uh, she has suffered for many years from a severe mental illness. And when I met her, she, she told me about her passion for art in general, for drawing and, and painting. and I. I encouraged her to learn how to paint. She was connected in the community to someone who could teach her how to paint. And she started painting and she shares uh, very often her, her the pictures of her painting with me. And she, now she's really thriving in her community. She is a primary school teacher. She, uh, this summer, she has organized a workshop where uh, she taught young people in her community how to do art craft and painting. So. Uh, really an inspiring story. And in these two, paint, uh, these two pieces uh, really captures two points of her recovery journey, not only hers, but also the, the journey of other people that I have had the chance to work with. A point 
where you have the suffering of the illness, the suffering even from the quest of care, the suffering from the side effects, stigma, discrimination, and violence from the community to a point in her recovery journey where you have light, dreams, and hope. So I share with you uh, this uh, very well-known definition of recovery from William Anthony, but I, I will use a simple definition that I like from Marianne Farkas, that's his recovery, as reclaiming a meaningful life. And in that personal process of reclaiming a meaningful life, psychosocial rehabilitation is the process that the provider can use to facilitate recovery. It is a set of techniques that uh, and tools that the provider, the, the service user can use to gain the skills they need to play the role that they value, that, that they want to play in society. And uh, in my own research, and just quickly to uh, acknowledge my mentors in that research that I did in, in the program in 2015 in Haiti, with the mentorship of Dr. Giuseppe Raviola, Professor Ann Becker, Professor Byron Good, uh, Dr. Hannah Gilbert, and still a Professor Paul Farmer. Uh, I did that research with people with uh, lived experience of severe mental illness, and they clearly stated that treatment without addressing the psychological, the social, and economic barriers of uh, recovery is like washing your hands and wiping them in the dirt. If there are Haitians uh, listening, they will, uh, uh, they will uh, recognize that saying. It's very common in Haiti. And there are strong evidences in the literature that psychosocial rehabilitation is effective to facilitate recovery. It is acceptable and feasible in low and middle income countries, including uh, some papers uh, by Laura Asher and some that uh, Vikram has co-authored. It is also, psychosocial rehabilitation is recommended as an essential option for mental health, uh, as an essential component of mental health treatment program by the academic literature, but also by um, the, by, by the WHO, for example, in the mental health gap uh, intervention guide, and also in a more recently published World Mental Health Report published this year. And, uh, but despite this recommend recommendation, you have a lack of integration of psychosocial rehabilitation services in um, mental health treatment programs in low and middle income countries, especially. This is very, uh, very common in high income countries, but I think there's an, an unacceptable uh, lack of psychosocial rehabilitation services in low and middle income countries, uh, given the importance of that for recovery. So after my thesis research, when I, I went um, back, I came back to Haiti and uh, to Zomi La Santé and in the, in the mental health program with my colleagues, it was really a strong program. Just to give you an example, um, we, uh, Dr. Giuseppe Raviola, the PIH mental health director, and the rest of the team, including myself, published a paper where you can see that uh, the program provided services to more than 6,000 people through 28,000 visits from 2016 to 2019. And so it was a strong program. And, but with the rest of the team, in, in, under the, the direction, the leadership of uh, the director of the program, Father Eddie Estash, we thought that we needed to structure more to strengthen what we have been doing in terms of facilitating psychosocial rehabilitation. And we started a series of meetings in 2017, 2018. We, um, we reviewed the literature and my research was the only research in Haiti that has explored the lived experience of recovery from people with uh, severe mental illness. So it was really central to what we wanted to do. And uh, one key finding uh, was the conceptualization of recovery as clinical and functional recovery, social and spiritual connection, and the ability to fulfill one's valued role, the ability to be 
a father, to be a mother, to be a church member, for example. So it was not only clinical improvement as uh, the, 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 the previous quote said it. Now, um, in Haiti, if I'm moving to Liberia, in Haiti, uh, we, 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 we designed the program and we had three social workers coming in to help us develop the program. But in really um, similar to what, what the participants of the research said, the, the, the program really slowed down, I have to say, because of lack of funding to implement it, the pro, all of the components of the program that we wanted to implement so that we can really concretely help people overcome the structural barriers to recovery and not really having a program where we were only reaching um, empowerment and not concretely giving people the tools, the means to, to, to be empowered and to facilitate empowerment. We did not want only to be preaching what Kim Hopper calls, for example, the near toothless gospel of hope. Um, so, um, but in, I had the chance and opportunity, great opportunity to be promoted to be the lead of the PIH Liberia Mental Health Program. And that was also an opportunity to transfer what I learned in Haiti to the Liberian context, but also to learn from the Liberian context sure. where many, many work in terms of community mental health has been doing and rehabilitation. And the team really was passionate about community mental health. So, and we had another chance of receiving funding from Grand Challenges Canada. And in addition to all the funding we had from Stone Many Voices, we decided to pilot a psychosocial rehabilitation program with the Grand Challenges Canada grant. And that was not an easy decision because uh, psychosocial rehabilitation is a hard target. Um, you, it's not, we're not sure that we would succeed. So I think the team took the challenge as in PIH, we like to say, uh, we do whatever it takes to really deliver something that impacts the, the, the service users' lives and that what they really need. So the cross-site mental health team gathered a team of experts uh, under the leadership of Mary Young that I am acknowledging, who was a psychiatric fellow in Liberia. And they designed the curriculum these are the three main goals of the curriculum, but uh, a main part of that curriculum was, it, uh, they designed the program, so, but the main part of the curriculum was um, the, the, a curriculum with 13 sessions that included really very important topics on psychosocial, related to psychosocial rehabilitation, such as human rights, stigma advocacy, and gender-based violence and social skills. Uh, this curriculum has been taught, uh, has been implemented in workshops uh, together with um, service users and also will be taught to um, care providers, to, to clinicians. And this is not, this doesn't go alone. It is uh, of course associated with the usual community mental, mental health uh, care, the social and economic support, and the social inclusion. And one of the great things that uh, the team did is that they partnered with a local office of Caritas for vocational training. And really this, this did, uh, this gave really great results. And the picture at the top uh, is, you, you, can, you can see some service users learning how to mix soap and then uh, going to do the little business after. This is a house that was built for one man that was homeless. Um, but of course, not all of the components had the same strength because of uh, resources. And the last picture is the picture of a lady with really an inspiring story, a difficult story as well. And the team had to do countless meetings with uh, her relatives, her neighbors, the community chiefs to, for her social inclusion. But she has been doing well for several years now and she integrated the vocational training program with Caritas. She learned, and she was the first one for whom we bought a sewing machine, by the way. And, um, and she graduated from the vocational uh, training program. And she also took part in the workshops on uh, with the topics with the curriculum that I shared before. And uh, by that time, I have to say that I left Liberia for my PhD studies and the team continued that work and com successfully completed really that pilot program. They organized the graduation ceremony 
It is important to note in that graduation ceremony, the presence of two Ministry of Health representatives in the county, the man in yellow and, and the one in black in the middle. And the man in white also is uh, the leader of a very powerful and inspiring user organization in Liberia that I had invited to partner with us in that effort. And the team is continuing is continu continuing to uh, work with him. So really this was a great work. And this reinforces the idea that psychosocial rehabilitation is feasible in places uh, like in Liberia, in, uh, in Haiti. Psychosocial rehabilitation has to be a, an essential component of mental health treatment program. And then we need more resources, more funding for psychosocial rehabilitation. Uh, the team is in Liberia is planning to publish this work, so I am looking forward to it. Um, and also the, the, um, the Ministry of Health is really interested and in want to replicate this work. Um, but I cannot end without thanking the team in Liberia, Dr. Olufonke, Gamay Achi, the Josiah and the Psychosocial Assistant who made this work possible. And also the Cross-Site Mental Health team under the, the leadership of Giuseppe Maviola Bepi and uh, Stephanie Smith and Heidi as well. Uh, third year stash, the former director, Dr. Brice Junior, uh, the new director and the rest of the team, Tatiana, will be there. But if for the Haitian team, I want to say happy Vertier a commemoration day. <laughs> uh, so this is the day of the Vertier, the commemoration of the last battle of the Haitian independence, where the Haitian army defeated the Napoleon army. And we have to say that uh, our country is still fighting on the way for its recovery as well. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Reginald. A happy commemoration day to you and to everyone else. And I, uh, I'm delighted that we're able to actually celebrate this, uh, this incredibly important historic moment with you uh, on this panel here today. Uh, you know, Reginald, you captured so much um, in, in, your, in your talk. And I, and I wanted to actually just get a sense of how and where your program of work is going right now as we speak. You know, I, I understand you're doing a PhD in Montreal, but you're also, of course, deeply connected with your work in Zambi La Sante. So yes. give us a sense of how the work you did as part of your thesis and what's happened since then. What is the direction you want to see it take going forward? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Vikram. Um, in, so uh, really, I, I could not, um, um, after I left Liberia, I left the team with really calm because I know the team was really um, the, 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 the implementer, but also passionate about this work. Um, so I left um, without any anxiety. And, but I, I stayed connected with the work, with the development of the curriculum. And right now um, that I am doing my field work for my PhD in Haiti. So I am uh, working at a higher level with uh, trying to not only uh, work with Zamila Sati to um, reinforce the health system strengthening work, strengthening work that we are doing with the Ministry of Health. Um, and that gives me another opportunity to also translate, uh, transfer what we, what we are doing in Zamila Sante, what we have been doing uh, in PIT in general to the Ministry of Health. And I have really some good relations with the mental health unit uh, at, the, um, at the national level. So um, the, the, this, this is, I just started this position, but uh, this is really uh, something that I'm looking forward to. But in terms of what, what is going on in, on the ground in Liberia right now, um, um, unfortunately the team cannot talk and they can write in the chat, but um, I think the, the, there's really um, great prospects uh, of, from what has been done. Of course, uh, the grant has ended and now we are looking for funding. But um, uh, I think, but even without funding, the team has always been doing great things, um, connecting people with the community, talking to people uh, in the community to receive service users at their home, service users who are homeless at their home. So I think, um, so the team really, and right now is really um, um, planning to, not only continue this work, but also I'm sure there will be some expansion of this work um, 
And of course, I have to say that uh, some uh, this, this is a work that we piloted in Liberia, but that will probably be implemented in other countries uh, where PIH is working. Well, thank you. Thank you, Reginald. I'm sure we'll have questions for you from the audience. Uh, let me move on uh, uh, before uh, we give a chance for an open discussion to the final panelist, uh, uh, Anil Brar. Uh, Anil is the co-founder and executive director of Mata Jaikor Maternal and Child Health Center which provides maternal health care to vulnerable women in a rural area of the state of Rajasthan in India. Part of this care delivery includes community-based perinatal depression interventions, uh, which he's going to be talking about today. Anil is also a PhD candidate uh, like Reginald, and it's always a delight to see how our students uh, move from their master's onto doctoral studies, continuing their scholarly journeys. Um, in Anil's case, um, he is a PhD candidate in medical anthropology at Oxford University in Britain and is uh, a recently appointed research fellow at the Aga Khan University's Brain and Mind Institute, uh, which has hubs in Karachi and in Nairobi. Uh, Anil, I'm sure you know that our department is about uh, to start a postdoctoral program on global mental health implementation science with this newly launched Brain and Mind Institute. And we look very much forward uh, to forging a relationship with BMI in the years ahead to build capacity in research in global mental health in East Africa and South Asia. Anil graduated from our program in 2016, uh, and he's going to be talking about the implementation uh, of a psychological intervention called the Thinking Healthy Program that was designed, in fact, in Pakistan by Atif Rahman uh, and his team uh, for the care of women with perinatal depression, where the care was being delivered by frontline workers, uh, both Pakistan and India, like many countries in the world, um, uh, experience very strong uh, disadvantage for women because of the patriarchal societies that uh, dominate in these parts of the world. Uh, and I'm sure what we're going to hear about from Anil is how uh, women with depression navigate these complex social structures uh, and, and, and how his program helps support them in that journey. Anil, over to you. Thanks, Vikram. So let me do this. Okay, so can you tell me, are you, are you just seeing my slides or are you seeing my notes? No, we're seeing slides? the notes too. So can okay. you go to, <laughs> you quit, take yeah. that out. Sorry, I tried, to, I tried to do it a different way, but I'll do it the, the old way. So just give me one second. Apologies for this. While we have this moment, I will just remind people we do have another um, panel coming up on December 9th that on refugee and migrant health. So we welcome you to join um, that. And I will also put a few um, things in the chat. Again, I'm just, Neil, start whenever you're ready. I'm just uh, going in here. If you're interested in learning about the MMSCGHC program, we can add you to our email list. Um, and again, we look forward to answering questions um, you can put them in the Q and A. Great. Okay. And now over to you. I'm just gonna adjust this. Okay. Sorry about that. So the uh, title of my talk is "Adapting and Scaling Up Thinking Healthy in Ganganagar, Gilgit, Balt Baltistan, and Chitral." And so these are our districts in India and Pakistan. Um, and I like talking about specific areas, which is why I put their sort of maybe unfamiliar names to some people, rather than, you know, provinces or states or countries. Um, and also, I know that uh, Joya likes the name of obscure geographic places where we do our work. So I put that on there. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk about the work that I've been doing since graduating in global uh, from the program, um, kind of in chronological order. And to kind of keep it within the time frame, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. But if anybody has questions about specific outcomes or methods or way we we did things, please feel free to ask. OK. So I'll begin, as I always do when I talk about my work, is um, by locating the space. Um, so uh, as Vikram said, I, I run a nonprofit called uh, Mata J Corps. And for the last 12 years, what we've been doing is uh, providing uh, 
perinatal and maternal health services for women in this very remote uh, district of Rajasthan in India called Ganganagar. Uh, we serve a catchment area of about 558 people, or sorry, 558 villages, um, which constitute about 80,000 women of childbearing age. That's probably gone up. This is from the 2011 census. And um, this is where I do my global health delivery work. And I'll say that since, uh, sorry, in addition to the master's program, uh, this is really where I learned how to do all this stuff, how to, where I learned about delivery, equity, justice, um, how to serve a community, um, and how to meaningfully, meaningfully be a part of this community. Um, and I still lean on a lot of the lessons that I learned in the program when I come up with challenges, which is all the time. Um, so I'll just, because we're talking about the program, I thought I'd just mention that. Um, our original purpose was, and still is, to provide these services to women who would otherwise not receive these services. Um, so in other words, uh, women who are vulnerable due to caste, class, poverty, etc. There are many axes of inequalities. Um, and by the time my, so my research as a master's student didn't involve mental health, but by the time my, re the, my time as a master's student ended, uh, it became pretty clear to me that we needed in our area to address mental health. And so I'm going to talk about what we did. Um, about that time, and apologies, I had like good animations here to make this less cluttered, but I'll just talk through it. Um, so at this time, I also discovered the Thinking Healthy program, which uh, Vikram mentioned was uh, piloted in and, and RCT'd in Pakistan. So in this is back in 2008. So Thinking Healthy, based on that trial, was adopted by the WHO. Um, it was since uh, adapted to be delivered by peers, meaning delivered by women who are, have the same profile of the women who are enrolled in the program. And these were trialed in two, dis, in, in two areas, one in Pakistan, one in India. And actually Vikram was the PI, I believe, on the India side. Um, so if you have more questions about this, you can ask him. But the point is that there was this really nice sort of robust evidence base that I could work with when I wanted to think about the mental health of the woman that we serve, which is very nice. Um, so what we decided to do, um, of course, at that time when those trials were completed, um, you know, they were only done in trials and they weren't scaled up really. They weren't really integrated into the healthcare system. So we thought that we could adapt the Thinking Healthy model, pilot it in our setting, and think of some implementation lessons. Um, so that's what we tried to do. Um, just like Fizeme, we won a Grand Challenges Canada grant to do this. Uh, this was back in 2017, 2018. Um, and I was able to work with uh, Sangath, um, people who uh, I still work with on many of my projects today uh, to sort of help. And um, Sangath was actually the, one of the implementing organizations for the, for the peer version um, in Goa. <clears throat> so here's some action shots from that time. Uh, these are the, the real stars of this program, our counselors who we recruited from the local community. Um, this is them doing screenings, uh, training. Um, and again, I'll leave aside our, our outcomes. Um, what I really wanted to emphasize here was um, some of our implementation and adaptation lessons. So I'll just mention, however, that um, using sort of mixed methods approaches, we did find that the project was quite feasible, um, quite acceptable. Uh, in our case, 86% of the women who um, were enrolled into the counseling program um, improved on their PHQ-9 scores, um, so Personal Health Questionnaire 9, which is what we use to screen them. Um, some of the important adaptations that we found had to do with how we screened. So I think in the, in the RCTs um, and in other places this is implemented, what people tend to do is use the PHQ-9. Um, in our case, we went door to door and asked the PHQ-9, and what we found is that our counselors came back to us saying that um, the screening tool isn't capturing everybody's experience. So what we did is we developed a new screening protocol where we used counselor expertise in addition to these screening tools to develop a way to find these people. And sometimes it involved doing going back to the house and finding a different time when they're sort of by themselves and can be a little bit more honest, but happy to talk about that more. Um, in the management of severe cases, so normally in this type of model, it's only about um, common mental health disorders. So what you, what you would do is you, if you found somebody who was suffering from something more severe, 
um, or even had suicidal ideation that was pretty um, risky, you would the counselor would then use the protocol to refer this person to a psychiatrist or a specialist that we had in our team. In reality, the management of these cases, and there were a few that emerged, ended up being a collaboration between the counselor and the specialist. Um, and I'll quote our psychiatrist in one of these cases. He said that your counselor is in better place to serve this woman because the counselor knows the context, knows the household, has access, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another really important lesson had to do with the counselor's personal transformation. Um, so behind in my animation behind that um, article, I had a picture of our counselor. Um, and I was going to then bring up this, this article which is actually one of the few, um, and it's actually a really beautiful article by Angela Leocata, um, Arthur Kleiman, and, and Vikram on the actual experience of caregiving for the counselors. Um, and that's what really stood out to us. Um, it's a really profound experience for counselors, and it's really understudied. Uh, and I think it has a lot of bearing on how these global mental health implementation programs work if they're scaled up, um, and that needs to be considered. And I'm, I'm happy to come back to that discussion as well because it's informing what we're doing next. Um, another important lesson has to do with the gaps in this program. So in our area, GBV or gender-based violence is highly, highly prevalent. Um, and there's only so much individual counseling, although THP is meant to also address the family, but really it's kind of individual counseling. There's only so much of that that you can provide and hope to address gender-based violence. Um, so, you know, you can do your session, but if that woman, has an abusive husband, you know, what are you really doing? Um, substance use is extremely high in this area, both among men and women. There are obviously social conditions. It's a very poor area. Um, and another thing that this program doesn't address um, is the issue of infant loss and grief. So infant mortality is high, neonatal mortality is also very high. And so inevitably we had patients who we enrolled in the program in the prenatal phase and then their infant died or they had a miscarriage. And our counselors couldn't simply just let them go. I mean, they had this relationship. So we're still in the process of developing how that relationship works and what sort of content we can give. Um, so just focusing back on the gender-based violence for a second, um, what we really wanted to do was we thought that the Thinking Healthy program and our adaptation of it could be adapted further to address this some way. And so this led to another project called Men Against Violence, um, for which we got funding from the Center for Global Health Delivery at Harvard Medical School. Um, and what we wanted to do here was simply understand better what we were dealing with. So it was a very qualitative, um, formative study. Our research questions were, what are the local perceptions and experiences of understanding GBV? What are some possible avenues for prevention and intervention? Who might be effective agents of change? And I'll say that the reason why we called it men against violence is because we had this notion going in based on our experience that some older men who are them reformed perpetrators of violence could be agents of change in talking to young men. And I'm not sure that that actually bared out, but it's still something worth, worth looking at and thinking of. But I think the more simple lesson that came out of this is how important it is for us to, in addition to women, address husbands or men when we're trying to improve uh, women's mental health. So I'll take you across the border to um, this really beautiful region called um, Gilgit and Balt Gilgit, Gilgit, Baltistan and Chitral. So this is actually a picture of Chitral. Um, I actually haven't been here. Um, this picture is taken by somebody else, but this notion um, uh, led me to speak with people who are involved in adapting THP to this context. And again, this area, although it's very different from Rajasthan, you know, ours is a desert, theirs is mountainous, but there are many similarities as well. We're both very remote, very rural, very poor health outcomes, high suicide rates. Um, in fact, Gilgit Baltistan is one of the few places that I know of uh, where the female suicide rate is higher than the male suicide rate. Um, so extremely um, difficult places for access. This, uh, so this map, you can see Gilgit Baltistan is in Kashmir. Um, Chitral is, it's kind of, you can see the edge of the district to the northwest. Uh, um, it's in uh, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa 
um, district. Um, and so what the project here was called is Tandrustri, which is, um, sorry, I mispronounced that, Tandrusti, which is uh, good health and, and uh, good wishes. And what we did here is because of the context, which makes individual counseling very difficult, this is basically has to do with terrain. We uh, adapted Thinking Healthy for a group setting, but we created content for both mothers and for fathers. Um, and this was to be delivered by volunteer health promoters, we called them in the area. Some of the content that we added to this had to do with wellness promotion, positive thinking, um, adult health and nutrition, child health and nutrition, social support, positive parenting, we felt was a really important uh, aspect, especially for fathers, uh, to prevent GBV. Um, you know, you create that bond and you emphasize the, the importance of, of being a parent, of, of sort of being that supportive role to your wife and to your child, and also respectful communication. So this work is literally going on now, just in the last month, they've trained 96 health promoters. Um, this is, these are some action shots of men's and women's groups in um, the Hundur Valley. And uh, lastly, I'm going to whiplash you back to Rajasthan, to Ganganagar, and talk about the Kushimamta program. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that the date that we started was 2018, and it went for 18 months. Um, so you might ask what happened during the pandemic, and essentially the project ended um, or stopped officially during the pandemic, partly because of the pandemic, but partly um, reflecting on, on um, Fiza Miz frustrations as well, is the funding ran out. So what actually ended up happening over the pandemic um, is our counselors continued their care relationships, which I thought was really, really fascinating. So they would get on the phone with people who they knew might be in difficult situations and kept that relationship alive. Um, what we've been fortunate to do to get in, in the last year are two new grants to kind of restart uh, Kushimamta and to scale it up and to, un and to learn about uh, how a program like this could dynamically change when you scale up. So I'll end on this slide and apologies again, I had animations here to make things a little bit easier, but um, I'll just leave you with the titles of the studies that um, are funded by one, the Canadian um, Institutes for Health Research and the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. Um, so, and then we, and that might give you a sense of what we're trying to do. So the first project is called Decolonizing Global Mental Health, Capturing Lay Counselor Experiences to Inform Scaling Up of a Perinatal Depression Program in Rural Rajasthan, India. So to unpack that a bit, what we're doing is we are now going from our original counselors. We had 10. We have nine now because people get married and move away and people have babies. So we have nine. Um, and we're going to recruit hopefully 30 to 40 more. And um, our counselor's uh, role basically changed, right? It goes from um, counselor to supervising counselor or manager and trainer. So their, their role as a person in this program drastically changes. And we know really nothing about the experience of this. And it's a crucial step in uh, making these sort of community-based models scale up and integrate into the system. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, do very community-based um, phenomenological interviewing, where we interview the counselors as they go through this process of transitioning to a different role, and we get their feedback, and we have them involved in the in the analysis and theme development part of um, of the analysis of the data. The second project is called Using Photo Voice and Critical Social Theory to Help Develop Culturally Safe Services for Perinatal Depression in Rural India. Um, I'll save the discussion of critical social theory. Basically, it sort of marks us as um, really interested in equity and justice. Um, but the really important methodological part here is the use of photo voice. And so what we're doing is we're taking women who are depressed and enrolled in the Kushimamta program, putting cameras in their hand to document their daily lives. And then we're gonna, and then we have 10 women who aren't depressed in the in the same community, put cameras in their hands to document their lives. And we're gonna have these women help us interpret what they feel is important about these about these cameras. Um, and it really is a, a sort of participant first um, way of understanding their lived experience. 
Um, and this is also just going on right now. So I'm in Kenya, but I should be back um, working on this. Uh, and I just put a, a little picture here of our team, um, which is just remarkable. So we have Abhijit, Dr. Abhijit Nadkarni at the front, to the left in the shorts. This is, they all went to Goa. I didn't get to go to Goa, but they all went to Goa for a, for a photo voice training um, program. Um, we have Dr. Shahi Rose um, on the right. We have Dr. Uh, Josephine Atoya from University of Ottawa. Dr. Shahi Rose uh, Premji is from York University in Canada. Um, in the middle with the turban is our local manager, um, Harman Shergill. Above that is Somia Singh, who has been involved with the MAV project and now this project and is just a superstar. Um, the person with the glasses on the right is Dr. Um, Ravi Agarwal, who is also deeply involved and actually was involved in the original design of Kushimamta before we got the Grand Challenges Canada grant. Um, sitting at the top in the middle is Shazad, who's a new uh, manager for us. And then the two women on the side are two of our counselors. So this has been really incredible when you take women from the community, um, you train them, you give them you know, a job, we pay our counselors. And then we can build their capacity and send them different different parts of India that I don't think they would ever have imagined going to. Um, and then the other person in the t-shirt is a professional photographer who we had to teach us how to take good photographs. So um, I'll leave it there and happy to answer more questions. Well, thank you so much, Anil. Another really you know rich presentation. Anil, I, this is a question I could ask all of you, but I want to really ask you because uh, you know this is an opportunity for me to understand how you navigate the delicate space between the lived experience which locates your mental health within the broader social world that you live in in this case you know the depression that women experience within the context of patriarchy violence um, and, and 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 poverty and the dominant biomedical focus on individual interventions uh, for recovery. All three of you have presented topics, and of course, this is, this is cuts across all of mental health in the global health context. Um, but for you, the question is, how do you navigate that space between giving psychological treatments through the thinking of the program, while at the same time acknowledging that actually women's experiences are not just private psychological ones, but in fact, deeply interconnected with their social world? So I, for me, what I found always useful in this is deferring to the frontline people. So the, the participants and the lay counselors themselves, which is why I find these sort of methodologies that we have like photo voice and phenomenological interviewing so, so important. So, you know, they're the ones who can tell us uh, what's not being addressed and what social factors are affecting, are affecting their lives rather than, um, you know, uh, you know, just a narrow view of depression. Um, so that's how I navigate it. And maybe that's my sort of lens as an anthropologist, but it really has to do with being there and being with them along the journey and kind of noticing things. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to hear what other people think. Well, let me let me just maybe summarize some of the key themes, and I want to then make sure we have time for the Q and A uh, from the audience. And again, just a reminder: there is a Q and A box, and Joya is going to be curating those questions. So, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Joya to curate. So, please do use that box to add your uh, questions. But I think what I, if if I had to sort of try and summarize these three incredibly rich presentations, let me first of all start by acknowledging uh, what a remarkable set of presentations those were. Um, but in summary, what we've heard heard from the three of you is, first of all, the importance of addressing the felt needs and priorities of the communities and individuals that you are actually working with, rather than applying an external one uh, that comes from some external epistemology, some external biomedical framework. Secondly, um, how you located mental health within the broader social and structural determinants of health and well-being, uh, in each of the three instances, one could enumerate the number of different kinds of factors that influence mental health, but also how mental health goes on to influence people's uh, social worlds. The third, we've heard from all three of you the importance of listening uh, to the lived experience. This is something which I believe has been one of the unique contributions, in fact, of global mental health um, uh, to the global health 
uh, discourse. The centrality of the lived experience and the utilization of qualitative research methods, including ethnographies, um, uh, as a way to explore that lived experience. The fourth is the application of biosocial, in fact, I, I'd expand that, biopsychosocial uh, frameworks uh, to understanding the causation of poor mental health uh, and how one can address that. And finally, the leveraging of people's own agency, uh, as well as the agency within their community, the resources that communities have, so that we don't treat communities as if they are passive recipients of external aid, but in fact, they have agency within their communities, uh, which needs facilitating and catalyzing so that in a sustainable way, you can address mental health uh, uh, concerns within those communities. Five remarkable presentations, uh, three remarkable presentations. Uh, and I wanna now make sure we have time. So I'm gonna hand over to, uh, to, to Joya to, to curate any questions uh, for our panel. Joya, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Vikram. And really, I agree, just such amazing, amazing presentations. And, you know, I just, I feel very proud that the three of you are graduates of the master's program that we're celebrating today. And it was nice to hear so many themes uh, that we cover in the, in the program. Um, I'm gonna give, um, senior faculty privilege to uh, to Byron Good to since he was involved with so many of you, all three of you, uh, to ask a question and then the, I will summarize the Q and A's in the chat. Byron. You should be, yeah, oh, there you are. Go ahead, Byron. Oh, whoops, unmute yourself. <laughs> There, we see you. Okay, I wasn't expecting to get on. I was just <laughs> expecting to send uh, a note to you all. It's really great to see all of you. Hi, fils -Aimé. It's really lovely to hear about. Actually, I didn't know about your publication and about your work on, on uh, recovery-oriented services uh, for persons with severe mental illness. I would love to hear more about that, but you and I should also be in touch uh, about that. Uh, Ginger, it's great. You know, I wrote in the in the uh, chat box a, a question about how you're trying to actually implement the findings now, since you're much more recently out of the program than uh, than uh, Fizeme and Anil. Anil, great to see you, and really fantastic to hear how this work has gone. Somehow, I when for all of these years I've known about about this project, I somehow did not really understand that you're working in over 500 villages. That's really quite a remarkable, um, you know, set in our work in Aceh, I remember we worked in a total of like 75 villages and that seemed quite overwhelming to us. So working in 500 villages is really quite extraordinary. And part of my question is how you hold all of that together. And I guess, Anil, the other thing that I would, would ask about is to what extent you are trying to actually build this into, um, into the mental health services of, of the state of India, that is into the, bureau, into the usual bureaucracy. Um, and what are the advantages of working as you do with your own NGO? And what are the advantages of trying to integrate this into larger services? But just terrific to hear from all of you about your work. Thanks, Byron. So. Um... I'm gonna, before you all answer that, I'm gonna add a few questions in the chat because we don't have tons of time. Um, but for each of you, I'm gonna kind of group the questions. Uh, for Ginger, uh, as Byron asked you about the implementation of your findings, um, but also whether you've seen uh, or you expect to see much of a rural urban disconnect. Um, many people noted that there have been, you know, increasing uh, suicides among adolescents during COVID. Um, and then the other question is, what is your um, view of the kind of suicide hotlines that are coming up? So those are questions for Ginger. And I do want to add for all of you that the art 
uh, issue, whether photo, um, painting, the drawings in Ginger's fantastic slides were done by Ginger herself, who's an artist. And so, you know, as, as you know, I'm a singer. So, uh, you know, what is the role of, of art in, um, in this? So that's, those are some, um, some questions for Ginger. Um, Fisame, uh, many people have asked you for your slides, for sharing. I know you'll get back to people. Um, but one interesting question that that also came from Byron was, you know, who designs the curriculum? Are they providers or are they people who are actually living with and recovering from mental illness? Um, and then there was a question that I'm going to direct to you because you're in the heat of it, which are how do you take care of populations that are, you know, under ongoing threats of violence and crisis, which I think um, and then a question about how do you monitor the outcomes? Do you have tools? Do you have ways to monitor the outcomes of psychosocial uh, rehab? And then lastly, for Anil, um, you know, I think people are intrigued by the idea of uh, men involved. And, and could you say a little bit more, particularly about the older men who seem to have um, learned to deal with their uh, feelings in a different way, and also about the um, the living arrangements or the structural issues, um, particularly mentioned, you know, women living with in-laws and not having power in their households, um, and have you encountered that? Um, and then there was a question about perinatal suicide um, specific to uh, India, Canada, but I, I mean, I think it could be uh, for for any of you. And I know, um, Anil, your, um, your work started really with pregnant women um, in, in your organization. Uh, and then I guess lastly, um, the, the, the question about whether, um, how, how we uh, think about culture, in these uh, different uh, programs. And I think all of you touched upon, um, you know, uh, how culture impacts your work. So those are the, the sort of sets of questions for all three of you. And I'll, I'll start with Ginger since you had gone first. Thank you, Zoya. Um, okay, so first I'll um, address the question on implementation. So I have been um, working with the Department of Health with some projects and, and they do have a focus now on school-based mental health programs, well, school-based programs in general, but um, working with schools for mental health. And we are actually developing a basic training module now on suicide prevention with the Department of Health. So that's ongoing. And the target is to pilot the implementation of that training um, sometime in January or February. So the goal there is to equip um, teaching and non-teaching staff of schools to um, not only address like mental health in general, because there have been a lot of resources about mental health um, in the past um, two years because of COVID, but also um, going specifically um, into suicide prevention, like just how do we talk about suicides? What terminologies should we use? How do we address um, this issue? How do we create protocols, like safety protocols in schools? So those are the things that we plan to um, roll out um, in the next uh, few months. So um, that's the work of the Department of Health. And when after we've piloted, we hope to have that formalized. Um, and then offer it to um, different um, public schools in, in the Philippines. So that's like, that's good news. Um, the other day, they also launched, uh, well, this they have a, um, an app also. They call it the Lusog Isip app. Lusog Isip is generally um, Healthy Mind. Um, they launched it last year. It's an app that teaches about um, mental health, about building skills. A lot of it is about self-care as well but it's an app that is adapted to the local context, a lot of local terminologies as well. So they've been launching and relaunching that the, the past few years, and they actually had a, um, a an activity just the other day and linking that to um, even interventions on um, substance abuse and how it can help people build their individual skills. Um, so at, there is some... Um, 
positive action <laughs> in that direction and and um I'm, I'm very happy to report that there is um some movement there um with regard to the urban and rural um question from what i know there isn't a lot of difference in terms of um like triggers or issues um for young people they're generally um around like you know family or other like personal interpersonal conflicts or even um academics but I guess because of COVID and a lot of things were shifted online, that actually improved access to a certain extent. So people didn't have to travel all the way to Metro Manila to get specialist care or to the big urban cities. Some of them can actually already be accessed online. So they didn't have to travel very far to access these services. And that's also true for the service providers. So access uh, to training for themselves so that they know how to address the needs of um, the, the populations that they, 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 they provide services to. So that has been a, a positive um, consequence of, of COVID. And related to that is the whole um, question about like the internet and hotlines and things online. Um, that, because the, the Philippines were like, we're like almost everyone is in so it's in Facebook. Um, so that is actually a very um it's a there's huge potential in maximizing the online space specifically for the Philippines and being able to utilize the online space, maximizing like algorithms, like search terms, so that when someone um posts something or wants to search um about suicide, then they are directly um, they're, they're redirected to resources and people who can help them automatically redirected to crisis lines and phone numbers and other resources so that they we don't miss that opportunity to 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 connect with them at the time that, that they need it the most um and lastly with regard to the arts so um what do i say with the arts it is um I, I personally think it's something that we we should explore more. Um, there are certain things like a lot of the interventions like I learned about when I was in my own training was um, a lot of like the cognitive interventions, a lot of, of, of that, that. But as we know, with people who are suffering, who have very difficult, who are carrying very difficult emotions, sometimes words are not the best way of communicating or expressing and processing these emotions. So the role of the arts, the role of creative therapies is, um, is very important as it might address the needs of other people. So apart from like artwork, I also have been doing animal assisted interventions. Mm -hmm. So the other day we were in a high school and all of the kids were so excited and just being there with like dogs and mm -hmm. using opportunity to kind of break barriers and enable that kind of conversation and facilitate that conversation and just create that safe space for them to bring themselves as they are regardless, no matter how they're feeling, they're accepted in, in that space. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ginger. Why don't we go to you, uh, Fisa May, and happy Vertier uh, comm commemoration. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll be quick. Um, thank you very much, Byron. It's great to see you. Uh, so just to be clear, not yet, unfortunately, I haven't published uh, the, the work from the thesis yet, but you know, it has really informed why, uh, that portion of the work that we've been doing. And I remember one conversation we had about the importance of connection uh, that was stressed uh, from the participants of the research. And really, that was, I think, a key um, thing also that we 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 try to implement in what we've been doing, uh, and the, you, there was a question also you asked about the curriculum. It is for both, so that we have two versions. There's a version for uh, the um, the the service users, and also there the, there is a version for the care provider and the clinician. And it has, I have to say, it uh, how was it built? Um, we we have we've started to have meetings with the service users, and uh, first and then, uh, but oh, I have to say mostly well, I, I can't say it was built uh, together with them, but we had their input and uh, the, the, there was a team that knew that worked with the service users in Liberia. Dr. Mary Young worked in Liberia for one year, 
And so she led the process from uh, her experience with the service users in Liberia. Um, so I think that is that part of the question. And one, the last question that is uh, the, mo the, 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 mo the monitoring question, I think that's uh, very important. And I answered in the chat some of the tools that we use and to measure functioning improve, functional improvement, we use the HUDAS, which is the w WHO Disability Assessment Schedule. And we, we used other school for clinical improvement and also some other indicators uh, for the process. But uh, HUDAS was, uh, I think, one of the key one, um, and it is uh, validated also in civil con many countries. Finally, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the important question of how do we provide care in uh, areas uh, where people are under threat, I think that's very, a, a very important one. But to be quick, I think we, we need to use what we have to provide care, to adapt what we don't have, to take care of ourselves, as gender uh, pointed at it uh, earlier. Uh, but also, there's a quote from Franz Fanon that I really like uh, that says, if psychi that mentioned that psychiatry is a discipline that allows the person not to be a stranger in their own environment and not to be aligned, al aligned in their own environment. And when, when we have a, an environment of violence and you say you're treating people and sending them back to that same environment. Um, so this is where comes advocacy that I really learned from Joya and others. <laughs> so uh, so we, not, we, we don't only just give care, but we need also to take into account what's happening in the environment and advocate to, to end that. It's not always, it's not the easy part, but it has to be done. Um, I, think, I think I covered you did. <laughs> of the yeah. question to be quick and to no, the time. I guess the, the, the one thing, just if you can add a, a couple seconds, Fizeme, on the mm -hmm. just sort of ongoing violence and how, and, and conflict and, and how a mental health, um, how do you think about mental health interventions and just dealing with mental health in a situation like you're in right now in Haiti? Um, oh, I, I know you can be more precise. <laughs> so for the interest of time, I don't want to. I, mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I just think, you know, how do you think about the conflict and violence impacting the programming for mental mm -hmm. health and just the overall mental health and well being of people uh, on the staff, people you're seeing? Like, what what ways are you trying to address that? Yes, yes, I have to say and give credit to the Haitian team right now because I'm not directly involved, but I'm I'm or, or, um, closely connected to the team. And uh, I think one, um, the impact, of course, is um, is mo really multi um, seen in many areas, many areas mm. where um, you see violence directly impacting people, but also um, the stress of insecurity of what may happen to me, what may happen tomorrow, uh, and what people are hearing. So um, what is what is being done right now? I mean, I think I'm mentioning only what Zamila Sante is doing and uh, is doing, it's also, it's not easy to keep the care open. And I think people are really being heroic to come and provide care to people. So keeping the services open um, so that people can receive care. And, I, and people are really conscious that this is a time where they need to be there for uh, those who need it. Um, and another thing is also the team, I've, I've heard from human resources and from the mental health team that they are, they are implementing civil interventions to take for um, well-being of the staff because not on everybody really is affected right now. Um, so I think taking care of the staff is very important. And not only by doing psychotherapy, but also making sure that some basic needs and, uh, and thinking about uh, safety also and how we could do whatever we can to uh, increase or reduce mm -hmm. the insecurity. Great, thank you. And lastly, Anil, um, you know, really uh, sort of the men against violence, people were quite interested, the structural issues of living arrangements and some of the perinatal mental health and suicide. 
so I'll, I'll uh, answer Byron's question first. Um, I think the way you put it is how do you hold it together? And then I started thinking about trying to do a PhD while, <laughs> while trying to implement grants and how do I hold it together? <laughs> but um, but what, what you're asking was how do, you, how do we as a nonprofit hold together serving 558 villages? And on one side of it, it's, it's pretty easy. And that's the, the clinical care side of it. Um, not necessarily easy, but it's easy conceptually because what we did was we built a clinic in a village and we just declared that this was our catchment area and anybody who came would be in our catchment area and we'd serve them. Um, the difficult part was then when you actually crit like critique as an organization that wants to serve vulnerable people, are you actually getting to the nooks and crannies of these communities? And some of them are pretty remote. Uh, to find women who are vulnerable. So uh, at one level, because we were rural and because we were friendly and because we were free, we lowered some barriers to care for prenatal and childbirth services. But there were women who were isolated. I mean, as part of the patriarchal structure in this area is that women get married into a different village, often have, have to live with people they don't know. Often that married village can be far away. So structurally, women are very, very vulnerable and very, very isolated. So the question that I had after my master's, after the master's program was, well, if we're really serving vulnerable people, how do we get to them? And that's where that question becomes much more difficult. And because we're going to them now, and, and I, we wanted to do it with a lay counselor program. So with the... With the pilot intervention, one of the really important lessons was how much our counselors could do. We had 10 counselors. We estimated that they could probably cover five, five villages each. So about 50, maybe 55 villages. And, you know, why did we think that? Well, because, I mean, these villages are pretty far apart. Women have a difficult time traveling in this area. It's hot. It's a desert. It's cold in the winter. All those factors. Um, they covered 155 villages, and they screened every single woman, every single perinatal woman over that time in these villages. So over 1,300 women. Um, so now, when we're thinking about scaling this up and going to 30 or 40 counselors or 50, I mean that expands us to most of our catchment area. And um, when you're thinking, when so to go to your question about how do we, um, you know, the difference between doing this as a nonprofit versus integrating it into the into the system. Um, integrating it into the system is the ultimate goal. And so what we want to do now is we've kind of phased this out. Um, we're going from a pilot intervention, which was pre-pandemic. Now we're this is kind of phase two. We want to see, can we make this happen with 40 or 50? And then we want to take this and see if we can partner with other people to kind of make it bigger. And then hopefully we can integrate this into the system. And I think the important thing is here is that we've actually had our local government involved with us the whole time. Um, so they they know what we're doing. It's the only way we could access the villages um, and access village data. We work closely with the existing um, community health workers who actually um, find the women who are pregnant or who have just delivered. Um, so yeah, what happens after this? I'm not sure. We're going to have to see. Um, but I know it's going to involve... Uh, you know, as inspired from all of you guys who make build this, especially partners in health is, you know, finding partners. And um, I think finding different ways of funding, um, which I'm trying to think of now. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that answers your question there. Um, to get to the other question. So um, the Men Against mm -hmm. Violence Project. Um, so this was is, is the idea of having a self- uh, self sort of reported um, reformed perpetrator of violence to be an agent of change comes from the example of somebody that I work closely with at Mata Jekor. He's in fact my cousin and he's in his 60s now. And if you look at him, you know, he's a farmer in that district. He's got a, if you look at him, he's like the epitome of a patriarch. He's got a turban, he's got a beard, he's a farmer. Um, but, you know, now he's like the biggest advocate for women's health and rights and justice in, in the region, which is really phenomenal. Um, and I think a really profound thing that I learned working with him is that he actually was 
um, a perpetrator of violence against his wife when he was younger. And he used to do drugs, so affected by substance abuse. So a lot of the things that affect men in this region, he went through and he was able to pull himself through it. And him as a, as a person, I found to be extremely inspiring for other men when we encountered women, he would talk to the men and we would just see this organic thing happen. So that's what um, inspired the study is like, well, is he a unicorn or can we find other men like this? Because even though it is a deep, deep patriarchy, you have men who are pro-woman in these places and you see it everywhere. You see fathers who love their daughters and love their daughters-in-law and kind of break the norms that, you know, we know the, the rules of patriarchy that they've been worked out through different ethnographic studies of these regions, but there are always exceptions. And we wanted to see, can we activate these exceptions? So I'm not sure. I'm, maybe my cousin is a unicorn. We found some, you know, reformed perpetrators. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, my cousin went through this journey with me and we learned together, you know, how to serve this community. And when you, you know, bring other people in, there's a learning curve they have to go through. But I think what we settled on after, after at the end of that MAV project was we still can leverage this idea, but we need to have counselors like the female lay counselors that we have for a woman. It'd be great if we had male counselors, so younger men who kind of, who are trained up in the protocols and the approaches and the theories, and then can be the ones who are responsible for leveraging what those older men as agents of change have. So that's the idea. Um, we applied for a grant challenges grant with this idea a couple of years ago, but didn't win. Um, so we're thinking of ways to kind of improve it and, and sell it a little bit more, but I think it's really important. Um, in terms of what this patriarchy actually is, uh, so Vikram kind of mentioned this, it's, it's a deeply, deeply patriarchal society with a lot of gender disadvantage. Um, and I think if you're gonna boil it down to one thing, it's the issue of marriage. Um, so epidemiologically, we know that in Northern India, marriage is actually a risk factor for mental illness, and it's a risk factor for suicide, whereas in other societies, it's a protective factor. Um, ironically, marriage in Northern India is a protective factor for suicide for men. Mm, so was... it's not going both ways, right? So it just, it just shows you like this, this structure of marrying out um, your worth as a human being, being, you know, producing children, um, specifically male children. Uh, there are all kinds of pressures on the woman. Um, they're the embodiment of family honor, right? Um, if you look at some of the work like Avina Das, they're also the embodiment of national honor. You know, they're the, they're the targets of public health programs as long as they're pregnant. But when they're not pregnant or they can't have babies, then they don't matter anymore. Um, so th it's just deeply, deeply patriarchal and risky for these women. Um, and of course, it sets up a situation where perinatal suicide is really important. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about, which is also an implementation lesson, is so suicide is the number one killer of women in that period, 15 to 49. So that's, you know, marriageable age and child rearing age. Um, so I, I really feel like you can recategorize suicide in that age as a kind of maternal death, right? Even if they're not pregnant. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay, right? Be yeah. Because the pressures yeah. are there, right? Even before, um, and maybe they're committing suicide because they can't get pregnant or they can't find the right husband or, um, or their husband's uh, abusive or whatever. Um, so that's one thing. The implementation lesson has to do with how our counselors handle this, right? And it, I think it's a really big ethical question for global mental health and the reliance on community health workers because we're putting our counselors in a situation like, let me put it this way, when we scale up, this is in the back of my mind, when we scale up, if suicide is the number one killer of women in this age group, our counselors are inevitably gonna encounter a patient who has suicidal ideation. And thankfully this past pilot, we were able to save their lives, which is great. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, if you expand this program, you're gonna encounter someone who takes their own life. 
and it's and despite the best efforts of the counselor and then what does that do to the counselor it's a it's a really big ethical question especially when you know for the professionals for the specialists we would never put them in a situation where they don't have themselves counseling support or other people to help them if they were to have a patient who committed suicide um so things i think about all the day and all, all the time and um that i i think are real questions and puzzles for the global mental health community to solve. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. I think this was a, just a terrific panel. I think we could talk for hours and hours and so much of it, in fact, is the legacy of this great department that we're all associated with. And so I wanna thank our speakers and I wanna thank our program coordinator, Christina Lively, for always staying on top of what all the alumni is doing. And um, you know, thank you all so much for tuning in.